some lovely beef paste there. Oh, hello everyone. I'm Barry Thumbs and welcome to Spray Social Monday. <clears throat> Hold on a minute. They can do it themselves this week. I've had enough. Eh? Well, that was unusual, wasn't it? Barry Thumbs was there, who appeared in our 2016 album, Enforced Fun, which made me think, why don't we have a look behind the scenes, maybe see how Enforced Fun came to be. Here it is, lovely packaging. A slightly flimsy cardboard, but a lovely picture of Jenny on the disc itself. In 2007, we kind of knocked spray on the head. We'd done uh, Children of the Lies God, and we thought it was our best work, great songs. We thought we were geniuses, and it was largely ignored by everybody in the entire world. So we went off and did other things. But by 2010, the uh, digital revolution had happened. Bandcamp had turned up, things like that. And I'd had a hit in 2009 with the Gold Major video on YouTube. We wondered if we could revitalise Spray to be uh, part of this new viral culture. And we sort of did that with everything better with Muppets and to a lesser extent Twitter campaign. Uh, but this ability to release stuff digitally at that point was uh, very exciting. And we did EPs for a couple of years at the same time writing songs for other people, selling songs to other people, pitching songs to other people, normal, ordinary, mainstream songs. Uh, and by 2015 we realised we had quite a few of these left on the shelf that were doing nothing. And by and large, that is what became Enforced Fun. A lot of rewriting. I mean, we didn't pitch songs like Fake Controversy Coincidentally Moves Product to people like One Direction. Uh, I don't think we ever pitched a song to One Direction, but you get the, the idea. Um, a lot of these got uh, revamped quite considerably, like Hit the Applause, like that was originally a song called Every Step I Take, and it was supposed to sound, it was a bit of a rip-off of Clean Bandit. We give it the synth pop uh, remix for this this album. We completely retooled it, but songs like uh, the Magic Eight Ball Lies and Fake Controversy with the aforementioned Barry Thumbs, uh, they remained pretty much as they were on the demos, lyrics aside. Which is why they've got this kind of uh, funky disco feel to them that isn't really very spray. Uh, not our usual sort of neon lights and uh, primary colours sound to them. Then the songs like You Show Me The Way, which is, is also very unspray like We'd written a song called You Show Me The Way, possibly as a Eurovision pitch, uh, but it sounded a bit Jesus-y, and we're not at all Jesus-y. So we got our good pal Charlie Merson, Eurovision winning Charlie Merson, to rewrite it for us, and he wrote it into a brilliant, brilliant, normal sounding ballad. Uh, very unspray like as I say, but so good, it just had to go on the album unchanged. He also did uh, the Magic 8-Ball Lies lyrics and he saved the 80s Never Died as well. He's like this figure who sort of swoops around in the background of, of spray, cropping up here and there. Uh, yeah, the 80s Never Died was originally called the Jet Set and we pitched it some K-pop bands, uh, but we didn't really know how to do it. So uh, he wrote the new lyrics for that and Donkey Beats, Stuart Bruce of Banoffee Sound Firm, he produced it in the end and all these great people came together to save what was a lost song. Uh, Tunnel Witch, Into a Tunnel. Uh, that was a song we wrote ripping off Into the Blue by Kylie. Is that a song by Kylie? Sounds about right. Uh, it was called Kiss Like Sugar originally. And then we got Screen B from the Cuban Boys, who uh, was responsible for the archive from which we got the pictures. Uh, he uh, wrote some kind of oblique and very exciting new lyrics for it. It became Into a Tunnel and the song that was gathering dust on the shelf of loved and unwanted by everybody has now uh, five, six years later, a spray live favourite, a high point of the set, ladies and gentlemen, an honest to God live favourite. So what else is on this? Old oh, Kid Cassio, he turned up on It's Not Enough, Good, we're big fans of him, uh, we sent him this track, asked him if he wanted to be on it, he said he'd love to, he sent it back, it was completely different, absolutely 100% different and 200% better, so good, thanks to him. And of course Hyperbubble, now, there's, there's big things coming from Hyperbubble very soon, watch this space, not this space, Another space, uh, but yeah, it's very nerve setting. That was never a song we were going to pitch to anybody. It was just us showing off and trying to write the most complicated song in the entire world. It's the night of the long knives, Charlie Brown. That was, you can hear it in the track, a, a really linear four on the floor dance banger we'd, we'd written for a German label, and we just uh, we added words to it, and it it, it it came out like it is, which is why it doesn't have that sort of natural spray feel about it. It feels a bit more organic. Is that a sort of concept that, that fits this? I don't know. Uh, 
Oh, and the opening, the prologue with Jane Badler. Jane Badler, legendary cult actress and vocalist. Charlie Mason had written a song for her that I had remixed, so we asked her if she would recite the prologue for the album, which we then built the, the music around. Now, the words of that, a few years previously, my band, The Attery Squash, who did a song called Devo, was right about everything, which we should do that in a live set. Uh, we'd asked Neil Gaiman to be on our album opening prologue, and he agreed to do it, and uh, it looked like it was going to happen, but it never quite did, which was uh, a shame. But uh, the, the text was still good, so I, I got out the tipex, rejigged the words, and Bob's your uncle. One prologue with Jern Battler. So that's it. That's uh, enforced fun in all its grey glory. <laughs>